I am a sex and relationship therapist in Denver, Colorado. Uh, my master's degree is in somatic psychotherapy. So that's body inclusive psychodynamic therapy. And then I also have a two-year postgraduate training in marriage and family therapy, which sounds really heteronormative, but it doesn't have to be. It's um, really any type of systemic lens for any type of relationship. So I specialize in ethical non-monogamy and other expansive models of sexuality. And so I'm applying that systemic lens to that work. And then I also have another two-year postgraduate certification as a sex therapist, uh, which so altogether, I have about seven or eight years postgraduate and graduate training to do what I do. I've been a therapist for about 15 years. And I think that's a good introduction. One of the issues in our field is that there's a lot of great, more traditional therapists who do awesome work and have zero training in sex and never ask their clients, whether they're individual or couples about their sex lives. And then we have these awesome sexologists, sex counselors, sex coaches, uh, who, and sexological body workers who work with clients and they only focus on sex. And so this type of a system keeps compartmentalizing sex instead of it being a complete part of a cohesive self. And so the type of work that I do, whether it's with relationships or whether it's with individuals, I'm always asking about sex and how that informs the rest of their lives. And I'm always asking about the rest of their lives and how that informs sex. Um, I'll often get referrals from other therapists and their clients will come to me and say, we have this great couples therapist, we love her, and we just want you to fix our erectile dysfunction. And I have to tell them, well, I can't just focus on that. I have to talk to you about everything, your religious background, your family of origin, what your earlier sexual experiences were like, what your friendships are like, all of that informs what's happening now that's keeping you from having a joyful and pleasurable sex life with your partner. You would say that there's not really a distinction because you do the relationship therapy and the sex therapy together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So some of my clients are individuals. Some of them are couples. Some of them are triads. Occasionally I'll have parents and kids and sex is going to come up in 99% of those at some point, at least with the history taking work that we do. With that in mind, is there a particular recurrent, how do I know where this block to sexual health that you see or sexual well-being that you see in your clients? I would say shame. And that can come up in a number of different ways. So we get messaging from our families, from our culture, from our media, from religion, uh, around sex and sexuality. And at best, it can be kind of a don't ask, don't tell this part of yourself is compartmentalized. And at worst, it can be this part of yourself is shameful and wrong and bad. So with my clients, I like to look at what kind of messages they may not even know they're bringing with them and to be able to unpack those and see what's really serving them and what they really want to keep carrying with them for the rest of their lives. With your engagement with your clients, do you think that it is getting better in recent years or do you think it's staying? the same or getting worse? I think that it has been getting better in a lot of different ways. One way that we can see that is that there's a lot more clinicians who are wanting to be trained as sex therapists, who are seeing the importance that that's a huge gap in their education uh, because most master's degrees and most licensure requirements include little to no requirements around sex. And so clinicians are saying, hey, that's not a requirement, but I still want to be able to have this to empower my clients to be more sex positive. And clients are coming to clinicians saying this is an important piece of what I want. Um, I see in the younger generations, the desire to be more clear about their own identities and to be more accepting of their own identities as not just straight or gay, but having a lot more labels to define who they are as demisexual, as abrosexual, as pansexual, these words that help us shape sexuality as being something that's acceptable and celebratory. So you would say in recent years, you feel like overall society is starting to slowly maybe shift away from some of the shameful programming that was so entrenched for so long. Yes. The caveat to that is whenever we are more sexually expansive within our culture, there's always a backlash. And I think we're really starting to see that in the last few years in terms of the backlash against uh 
trans people, the backlash against uh, seeking abortion, and um, there's a real resurgence around sex negativity and uh, religious ideologies shaping how we think about sex. Um, I see that in some ways as a positive, that the reason there's that backlash is because there has been this huge seismic shift. We saw somewhat of this, the same thing um, at a few different points in the last century where there was some opening up of sex positivity within the general zeitgeist and then a backlash against it. But the backlash doesn't take us back to the dark ages. It just takes us down in a little dip. And then we start going back into that expanse of sex positivity again, even more. What are your thoughts on camming? Well, I love it. And I'm surprised that I love it. Before I started working during the pandemic, I would never have worked virtually myself because I am a really body inclusive person. I felt like I need to be in the room with people to do profound work as a therapist and people need to be in a room with each other to do that profound work. The pandemic forced us into a virtual context. And I was really surprised to see that a lot of the things that I thought you had to be in the same room for, for therapy were still possible. One of those things is limbic resonance. So limbic resonance is the speaking to the limbic part of our mammalian brains. Uh, so all complex limbic systems have this ability to connect to other complex limbic systems. We do that mostly with our partners, but we also do that with our kids. And we also even do that with mammals that we have for pets. So that's why cats and dogs in a lot of ways make better pets than than birds and snakes because we can connect to their limbic systems. Um, and the way that we get that connection is through eye contact, physical contact, playful roughhousing, belly laughter, and this releases oxytocin, dopamine, norepinephrine, all these good neurotransmitters and hormones. So for a long time, I thought that limbic resonance was something that could only happen physically because a lot of that speaks to physical touch, right? And being around someone. But I was able to find through my own work as a therapist that a lot of that eye contact can still occur. So you and I are still getting some release right now, having eye contact, even though it's virtual. And so we still have an ability to connect our mammalian brains. And I think that's the same thing with camming, that people are able to access their vulnerable selves and to be able to start to explore some challenging areas of their own sexuality with another real human being. And at the same time, have it be within a certain safe context for both your members and your models, right? So that's why I love camming. I think it allows people to do some valuable work of human connection and valuable work around their sexual identity. Well, it's safer for both people who are participating. When you were talking a few minutes ago about the backlash that people experience, I obviously was thinking about our models, like Jasmine models, because these are, this is a group who has in many ways taken control of their own pleasure and their job is to help liberate others to find theirs as well and help take control of it. And they face a lot of stigma and judgment, not just by, you know, the social media police, but mm. just in, in general in society. Sometimes I've, I've had models tell me that they've had issues when they're trying to get a loan for the house that they can afford because they're, you know, we call them our Jasmine millionaires, but we have models who have become actual millionaires through, you know, the measure of us dollars just from camming, but because of the nature of their industry, they face a lot of hardship in the world. Um, that's not fair or right, you know, and like you just mentioned, you seem to have a really good grasp on what this uh, industry is really about, because as we know, you can find sexual content for free online where you're not paying by the minute, but when you are paying by the minute for another human being, I love how you talked about the mammalian brains connecting um, you're, to me, it's very clear that you're seeking something beyond just sexual content. It is this sense of connection and, um, what's the word I'm looking for interaction. It's a sense of interaction that you're really seeking. I'm curious, you, you know, you said that you found during the pandemic that you're still able to connect to someone's 
mammalian brain through Zoom or video call or whatever the case is through eye contact. Um, and I'm sure even sometimes mirroring someone's action, mm-hmm. which we unconsciously do might help with that. But what is the benefit or relief to being connected to someone's mammalian brain? Uh, what does that give us if even unconsciously? It's arguably the most important thing for longevity and mental health is connection to other human beings and other mammals. If we don't have other human beings available to us is to be able to have, again, oxytocin, dopamine, norepinephrine. Those are all really important things for our physical health, for our heart health, for our gut health, but then also for our mental health to keep us from anxiety, to keep us out of depression. During the pandemic, a lot of us felt the loss of some of those human connections that we had. Um, One of the things that was talked about a lot was the loss of weak ties. So those are the people that we might wave to or say hi to in the elevator. We order our sandwich from at the deli, that those actually were all still moments of limbic resonance, moments of connection with another human. Um, But then also the loss of these really depthful human connections where we're able to expose ourselves beyond how we show up when we order a sandwich at the deli is really important and profound as well. And our sexual selves is a big part of that. So when we're able to forge a real human connection with someone, whether we are engaging in sexual behavior or not, but where we can talk about in a real way, our desires and our sexual selves, that's profound for our whole sense of well-being and potentially I don't feel like I'm being hyperbolic when I say can extend our lives because we know that loneliness kills. We know that loneliness is something that causes people to die early. Oh yeah. I mean, I was just reviewing that study a few weeks ago where they, there's actual scientific proof and research that says that feeling lonely and being lonely is, has the same consequences on your health as smoking two packs of cigarettes a day. There's the exact same physiological consequence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're meant to be tribal creatures. We're not meant to be so isolated and alone, living alone in our homes on computers and not interacting with other human beings. Um, And I think that that's where this idea that oh, well, interacting through camming, that's not real. That's more of that being isolated in your home and not really connecting. But there is a genuine connection that can happen. And for some people, they don't have that available to them in other ways. Um, And it's, it's important to be able to access that in an emotionally safe way and a physically safe way somehow, even if it is virtual. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's, that's certainly, I mean, I've interviewed hundreds of members and models at this point. And when we kind of started this project, we were still in the pandemic to a degree. And that was the number one thing that many of these members that I was interviewing at that time that actually brought them to Live Jasmine was they were isolated in their home and they were just seeking like this connection or intimacy or, you know, whatever the case was. Some of them had just, you know, lost a partner or spouse, or um, some of them have disabilities and were even less able to interact than what mm-hmm. they normally are, and were just feeling so, so lonely. Um, I'm curious, ha- have you ever had a client who either was a sex worker or used something like a campsite? Yes, I have had on both sides. I have had clients who identify as sex workers who have worked through camming um, and also uh, clients who have um, had OnlyFans profiles and may or may not have identified as sex workers. And then I've also had clients who utilize those various sites um, for various reasons and often for a sense of connection. I'm curious your thoughts on this. It's just my random question. I know everyone has different reasons for engaging in sexuality, but in general, would you say that we connect to get sex or that sometimes we use sex to connect? 
sex is by its very definition, a way to connect. So even if somebody feels like I'm just doing this to get off, it's not really about my partner. It, it is on some level. This is, is sex is one of our deepest ways that we connect to other humans. It's, it's profoundly human in and of itself. It's necessary uh, when we cut off that aspect of ourselves, we are atrophying a part of our holistic self. What are your thoughts about fantasy? Fantasy plays a really important role in sex. And oftentimes people don't even know that. So often I'll have couples who come see me and um, more often than not, it would be the woman in this scenario, but sometimes it's the guy who is not able to orgasm. Um, and when I ask them about fantasy or when I ask them about solo sex or masturbation, they often say, oh, well, I'm in a relationship. So I only ever want to think about my partner. And when I'm with them and we're having sex, I only think about my partner. And our brains aren't really designed to work that way. Our inner sexual world is complex. And in order to really allow it to fully expand and be what it needs to be for us, we have to allow some fantasy and some solo sex to come into play so that we know our own bodies and know ourselves. And so when you're with your partner, if you're having fantasy thoughts that aren't about your partner um, and you feel like that's cheating, that can just totally shut down your whole body. And it feels like shame and it feels like guilt. And then you can't access the closeness with your partner paradoxically. So one of the things I help my clients to do is to really expand that notion of what does it mean to be sexual myself and to be in connection with my partner as a sexual being. And if that sexuality in myself, I don't have a lot of awareness of, I encourage them to explore that through fantasy and through solo sex on their own. And that allows them to show up even more fully with a partner. Um, now, in terms of non-partnered individuals, fantasy is even more important, right? Because they may not be partnered anytime in the future. They may never be partnered in a traditional heteronormative sense. And that doesn't take away the fact that they are fully sexual beings. So being able to fully explore what your fantasies are, what it is that um, allows you to be in full joy and pleasure in your body is really important. And sometimes we need another human being to help us with that versus just scrolling through porn or just thinking what gets me off to be able to talk and be vulnerable with another human, even virtually so that you can explore yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. That, I mean, I feel like fantasy is one of the number one reasons, one of the number one reasons that members come to the site. Our erotic blueprint that gets shaped when we're young, um, it's something that is oftentimes even pre-verbal, the things that become fantasies for us or the things that become intrinsic to who we are as sexual beings. So we can't just wish those away or go change them. Those are something that are a part of us. And if we're trying to cut ourselves off from that, whether it's something in the BDSM spectrum, whether it's our sexual orientation, we're not going to be able to just wish that away. Um, so acceptance for ourselves and acceptance from our partners is really important to be fully integrated. Another flip side of that, though, you don't necessarily have to enact all of your fantasies in order for them to be integrated and shame free. It can be both a part of your erotic blueprint and something that's intrinsic to who you are and who gets you off. And you don't ever want to enact that in real life, or you may want to enact that in a really safe and contained scene. Um or you might never enact it anywhere other than in your brain. And so that's important too, to know that just because you or your partner has a fantasy and opening up and embracing and accepting that fantasy doesn't have to mean that, well, then that's the only way you're going to get off and you're going to have to enact that in the real world forever or at all. Very interesting. Yeah, this is, I've heard a few times that our sexual blueprint, so to speak, mm -hmm. is developed even starting in the womb and then in those very early years, mm -hmm. um, particularly the person who shared this with me, who, who was really an expert and specialized in fantasy said, especially um, men, their, mm -hmm. their blueprint does really does not change. Yeah. So oftentimes, um, 
and this is actually true for female bodied individuals quite a bit is the, the first way that they accidentally experience arousal and or orgasm often when they're really young, like age two, then that plays a part in how they then enact solo sex or masturbation later and how they even want to receive, um, touch from their partners or stimulation from their partners. So like, um, you know, some young girls might experience that arousal with water, for example. And so then that kind of water type of touch is something that's always part of fantasy, always part of how they like to experience stimulation. If you could give a message to everyone in the world about human sexuality that you don't think people are understanding right now, what would that message be? That every person intrinsically has sexuality as a huge part of them and particularly female and bodied individuals are no less. So we get no less aroused. We're no less driven by sex. We have no less fantasy than men do. And the only research that has shown that has been because of the lens that we've looked at it towards. And um, Wednesday Martin does a great job of talking about this in her books, particularly the book Untrue. She systemically goes through and shows how the research bias has been there from the beginning. And when we really look at it through a different lens, the only reason why women have been said to be motivated by monogamy or be um, not to be motivated by sex is um, because of safety within their culture that, you know, they might actually get killed if they try to pursue sex or try to pursue, um, you know, non-monogamy. And when we really correct for that bias, they're just as sexual as male-bodied individuals are. And along with that, I would say children too are sexual beings. In the American culture, we really try to desexualize our children um, and even teenagers. This concept that you're not sexual till you're older really does a number on kids who are needing to get information and needing to start to process their own identity if they're being told they're not sexual. Um, So comprehensive sex ed is something that I think is really important and not just in terms of what the risks are for pregnancy and STIs, but encouraging kids from a young age to be able to be in touch with their bodies, be able able to be in touch with not only their no, but also their enthusiastic yes, and to let sensation be something that is positive for them to explore. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I actually interviewed Wednesday for this series and she said said exactly that. (laughs) Yeah. Even down to, you know, the right type of education for kids and, and making it less shameful. Sometimes parents, you know, they're not trying to be shaming, but even just one moment of telling their little kid, don't touch your penis or don't touch your vulva, um, or you're not supposed to do that, or that's not supposed to feel good. Um, just one moment of that can be enough to really shut a child down to know, oh, this is a shameful part of me that I keep secret. They still often explore it, but they explore it, you know, and they know that it's not something they can talk about, particularly to adults. And so that's where that diversion begins of feeling like there's yourself and then there's your shameful secret sexual self. Um, I have a daughter, she's eight. And I will say that she has been sexual her whole life. And we work really hard to um, obviously have age appropriate conversations and have um, conversations about what's appropriate in public and not. But I see her so different than kids of my generation being able to know it's okay to have feelings when you see something sexy on TV, when you see people kiss, she has a reaction to that. She has a feeling in her body around that. Um, And she experiences sensation on her vulva and that's okay. And we allow her to have that and to explore that without shaming. I was watching, I, I only saw a clip of it and it was a while ago, but you know, the red table talk, someone had was having a similar discussion and had mentioned we even you know we call it our private parts Mm -hmm. like it's very much like don't touch it's private you know and and that already at a young age like kind of puts this idea in our minds that okay this is hidden and it needs to be hidden 
Right. And so she knows, you know, it's not appropriate to touch her vulva at school. And she knows that she needs to wash her hands because that's an area that can have bacteria. But other than that, we keep it open. And when she asks us questions about penises or vulvas or what's going on, we answer them. And when she gets kind of saturated or bored with that answer, we keep it at a low level. And we know that she'll feel comfortable to circle back and ask us more questions when she's ready and to process that information. Yeah. And that is kind of keeping it a safe place where you know that in the future you can be there for her and guide her and she's going to feel safe coming to you. Because I do think it's true, you know, when you're an adolescent and you don't feel like you have any safe place to turn to, you might just make your own decisions that might not be very safe in themselves. Whereas if you felt safe to go to your parents and learn more, you might make a different choice that might be better for you in the long run. I think when you keep things kind of open like that, it, yeah, it just keeps things more safe. Same with this industry. I always say, you know, driving sex work underground is one of the worst things that could be done. If you're Mm -hmm. really concerned about society and people's safety. Absolutely. Because then sex workers don't have a safe place to go when things happen to them, right? Because they are breaking the law. So um, it's this backward system where we say that sex work is illegal. And so we arrest sex workers ostensibly to protect them. And that's not how you protect people by shaming, demonizing, and having legal and social repercussions for the work that you do. And we see that across the landscape with sex, right? So we know for a fact that when we have less sex education and that when we have abortion illegalized, there are more teen pregnancies, there are more unwanted pregnancies, there are more abortions. Paradoxically, when abortion is safe and legal, the abortion rates go down because people are well-educated about it and people know what their options are. Hmm. Very interesting. Yeah, I think I think it's the same thing with, sex ed is that the Mm -hmm. more educated sex or children are the less sex they're having actually right when you have abstinence only education you end up with teen pregnancy you end up with a lot of anal sex that's often um uh you know painful and not well performed because they believe well that's not sex it doesn't count so i guess it's okay um you end up with uh, people, female bodied individuals in particular, who don't feel like they can say no, but also don't feel like they can say yes. I mean, it's across the board that abstinence education, which is an oxymoron, is not doing our culture any favors and is resulting in more STIs, more unwanted pregnancies, more abortions. But I believe in empowering my child, not just around sex, but around all information. I think that when she has information, she can grow up into a person who can make her own decisions and I don't have to fear for her. So I'm not protecting her by sheltering her. I'm protecting her by giving her the tools to advocate for herself and to keep herself safe and to know what she's talking about, whether it's sex or something else. I interviewed someone who was raised in a very strict religious household and was kind of taught like abstinence and sex is really bad. And then actually when she got married and she did wait until she got married, she still had that programming that sex is bad. Mm -hmm. So even though she had done it in the way that she had been taught, the programming that she had her whole life, that this is a bad thing to do made her sex life with her husband very uncomfortable in the beginning. And that's another thing is that when we're not just gradually and honestly sharing information, whatever shared during that time, where does it go? Mm -hmm. So there. Yeah. Yeah, Sex is not sex and sexuality are not just a switch that can be flipped. Right. So um, even if you take kind of that religious shaming context out of it, um, spending a lifetime trying not to get pregnant and then trying to get pregnant can be really different for couples, right? It's like you spend your life taking birth control and being really careful and maybe using condoms. And then suddenly I want the thing that I didn't want for 30 years. That can be a huge shift. And so the more we can have an integrated sense of sexuality and, um, Even again, when you take the whole religious shame out of it, have sex ed be more than just STI risk and pregnancy risk, but to have it be about pleasure and about enjoying your own sensations and knowing who you are, then when you get to a choice point where you're going from 
you do want to get don't want to get pregnant to do want to get pregnant, that's an easier shift to make because it's not just, oh, sex all this time was something we did and it's fun, but like definitely focus on don't get STIs, don't get pregnant, don't do that. And that's the overarching feeling, then it's a huge shift. But if that's just a small part of it, like, yeah, we take precautions, but also sex is a huge part of our lives and it's something that we enjoy and it's not fear-based, then it's not as big a shift to, and now we're trying to get pregnant. Um, yeah. And I see that all the time with couples who have religious trauma in their backgrounds, um, particularly for female bodied individuals that they have anorgasmia, they've never had an orgasm or they're not able to have an orgasm or they have sexual pain or they have tension. Um, they may not be able to even have penetration because they have pain and tension. Um, and oftentimes that's rooted psychologically in that shame that had been there all their lives. So now, even though they're married, they can't just suddenly say like, oh, sex is good and I can enjoy it now. It's really ingrained. It's too late. Their parents and their culture have done that damage to their own kids. And it's really sad. What would you say are our next steps as a collective to start removing this shame out of society and really moving forward in a society that can be sexually healthy? modeling is a big part of that, right? So be the change you wish to, to see in the world. So being able to be honest about who you are as a sexual person. And I think we're seeing that more people being honest about having had miscarriages, having had abortions, people being honest about masturbating, people being honest about having multiple sexual partners or um, partners before they got married, people being honest that they're bisexual or pansexual or omnisexual, um, being open and upfront about those things, even with strangers. Um, you know, I have a bisexual flag that I have in my car just because even if a lot of people don't know what it is, I like to have it be out there so that people who see it and do know what it is, they say there's one more person who's out and proud as a bisexual person, right? Um, to be able to talk openly about sex and sexual identities to our kids, to our colleagues, to our friends. The more we do that, the more sex positivity just becomes a part of the fabric of who we are versus something that's compartmentalized and over there. And we might advocate for it if we have to, but it's not part of our daily life. If as clinicians, we don't ask our clients about sex, then they're implicitly getting the message. It's not okay to talk about sex. And so Couples can go to couples therapy for years and never feel safe talking about sex because their clinician hasn't asked them and because they don't have the the words and the, the context to be able to say, hey, I think sex is a part of what's going on for us. Can we talk about that now? Very well said. Thank you. My final question is just, is there anything about human connection, human sexuality, sex work that we haven't touched on, but you feel impressed to share or you want to share? Sex is awesome. If people had more orgasms and more touch pleasure and more connection with other human beings, I think a lot of the problems in our world would go away because so much tension, anxiety, stress, anger, unresolved emotions comes from not having that comfortability with ourselves and with our partners to be able to be authentically who we are and to explore pleasure the way we authentically are. You heard it here. Go explore <laughs> your pleasure. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, it was good to talk with you today. Thanks for what you're doing to change our world. And it was good to talk to you today, Ty. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And same to you.